Well, chapter six of the book of Daniel is what we're going to get into today. Uh, this is probably one of the most well-recognized chapters out of the book of Daniel, because uh, we're going to get into the lion's den story in this chapter. Uh, now, this chapter starts off with Darius. Okay, We ended last chapter talking about Darius as the liberator of the, the people at Babylon and the Jews, but history says it's actually Cyrus. So Darius was the leader after Cyrus. Now, we could look at chapter 6 and say maybe this is still part of Cyrus's, but they just used the Darius name uh, to simplify things and not have multiple kings of, of Persia in there. Um, but maybe this is actually after Cyrus had passed away and Darius took over. Um, not quite sure which one's going to be the more accurate way to think about that from a historical standpoint. But anyways, chapter 6 is getting into interactions between Daniel and Darius. Okay, at least that's how it's been it's been written here. So uh, if you have more advice or tips or advice, you're a Bible scholar and want to clarify some things in here around Cyrus and Darius, feel free to in the comments. I'd love to get your comments. So let's jump into chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. So this is now Persia, Babylon, everything basically. Verse 2, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was First, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. So Darius is going to set 120 princes over all the area, and then over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. So there's three presidents above the 120, and then the three presidents report to the king. Basically, Daniel's one of those three. Uh, so Kyle and Delich had an interesting comment on this. He says, the successor... Uh, to Belshazzar would be inclined toward its recognition, Daniel's promotion. So here's the thing: when, when, if you remember, when uh, it, Cyrus comes in to do this, Daniel has just been field promoted to be one of three uh, rulers. So Daniel gets put in as a ruler under the king, basically. Uh, by the reflection that Daniel's interpretation of the mysterious writing from God, uh, the putting of Belshazzar to death, appeared to have a higher sanction presenting itself as it were something determined in the councils of the gods, whereby the successor might claim before the people that his usurpation of the throne was rendered legitimate. Such a reflection might move him to confirm Daniel's elevation to the office to which Belshazzar had raised him. That's the, their Bible commentary. So this could be seen, oh, Daniel correctly interpreted that the kingdom was gone, everything, you know, I'm sure this got to the words of Cyrus or Darius and went, oh, he interpreted this. I like this guy. This is good. He's on our side, apparently. He, he was appointed ruler. Okay, well, we're going to make him a ruler with us, too. Uh, so maybe that's why Daniel got in up to that point. Um, so these are the people. This is how he's got the rule, basically. So king is somewhat elevated and distanced away from the people, so he doesn't have to deal with a lot of the normal stuff. The king gets to be seen as the high king, amazing, but he doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day -day things, basically. Uh, verse 3, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king sought to set him over the whole realm. So the, the king wants to elevate Daniel closer to himself. Uh, verse 4, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. So the, the people realized this Jew is getting ahead of us. Aren't they the enemy? Aren't they the you know these this backwater crazy people that we've that Babylon destroyed seventy years ago? Why, why is he getting promoted over us? He's the foreigner. We're not. And so again, we he Daniel probably faces a lot in uh, Babylon. Is like like we talked about in the past chapters. But here's the problem. But they could find none occasion nor fault. Dang it, Daniel's just that good of a guy. They just couldn't find a problem with him. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So he was, they're like, man, this kid is honest. He's hardworking. He has integrity. He's doing his best to represent the king and the palace. Crap, he's a good guy. <laughs> we, can't, we can't find a reason to hate him. Verse 5. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they went, oh, now we can't go after Daniel. The guy is clean as a whistle. He is a good guy. He's hardworking. He's loyal. 
He's doing his civic duties. He's an awesome guy. But he believes in a different religion than we do. So what if we get a law passed that goes against his religion? Maybe we could get make form a contradiction in his mind and see if he will stay true to his God or if he won't. Verse 6, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said unto him, thus, and said thus unto him, Darius, live forever. So they're going to pull a fast one sneakily here. Verse 7, All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute, to make a firm decree. So they're trying to say, Hey, all of us people have gotten together and we think this should be an important law in our land. And to make it a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So basically, if you worship any, if you say any petition to any god other than to the king, so the king is God, go to him, not your other gods, go to the king, okay, you will be punished. So basically we're outlying at religion outside of re- worshiping the king. Verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Now here's what's interesting about this, okay? When the king, and this is this is in history, when the king made a decree, it's not allowed to be broken. Even the king can't break it. So they're solid because they believe the king was a god. It made it solid and the god can't dispute himself. And so they can't get rid of it. Even himself can't get rid of it. But what they did was tricky. They put a time limit on the rule. So even though it's an irrevocable decree, eventually it's going to get revoked because it only is going to be around for a limited time, the 30 days. So for the next 30 days, no one can use, for the next 30 days, religion is outlawed except for king worship, basically. So that's how they, that's how they manipulated the rules to get what they wanted. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. Verse nine, wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. And I'm sure Darius went, oh, worship me. I like this. This is going to, this is going to build my reputation up. This is going to make me seem more elevated in the eyes of everybody. I like this. This is good. Verse 10, unintended consequences. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So he's still doing his religious worship because he's like, oh, this is bad, but I'm still worshiping my God because I know he's the real God. So he's not ashamed to pray and to do this, but that means technically he is he has violated this irrevocable decree. So this unalterable law of the Medes and Persians would have been terrifying to any man, but the faithful Daniel did not flinch. Was there any question what he should do? He could save his life by abandoning his prayers to the living God. What was he to do? A man of integrity could not fail. Daniel was the soul of integrity. That's uh, Kimball in his book, Integrity, talked about Daniel. And this, this is a good example of Daniel showing his integrity to God. So verse 11, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So they, they watched him. They were spying on him to see what he would do. Verse 12, then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. And hast thou, saying, hast thou not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. So it's irrevocable. This is a true decree. You are right. I did sign that decree. Verse 13, Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. He's violating that rule. Verse 14, Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, 
So now he's realizing the unintended consequence of his policy. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So he's trying to figure out how can I get around this? How can I deal with this irrevocable decree? What can I do? And he's bound. He can't do it without challenging and basically threatening the destruction of his own kingdom. If he's seen as not the true ruler because he's changing his own decrees and dealing with this, that could threaten his kingdom, which means somebody else is going to want to throw, overthrow him and become the king. So verse 15, Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. So they're reminding him, you can't change it, king. You can't get around this. Ha, 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 ha. Verse 16, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So the king understood who Daniel's God was. And that Daniel had a pretty powerful God, basically. And that's where he is, basically. So so if this is Darius, Darius understands, hey, you know, I, I, you're an awesome guy, Daniel. I really hope your God steps in to help you, basically. Verse 17, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Now, interesting thought about this. Okay, Another time a stone was rolled over a tomb. This is probably going to be Daniel's tomb because he should be mauled and just killed by these lions. Uh, we can think of this as an idea of Christ, the stone being rolled over his tomb as well. It's kind of a cool symbology that we see in there. Verse 18, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when the king came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? He might not be able to see into this. Like, it's so dark, he might not see into, into this cave. Uh, verse 21, Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No man of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. So that's, he was saved from this. Uh, which the king was very happy about. And I'm sure Daniel was too, by the whole situation as well. Now realize, this is pretty cool. If you, I, I like this, there's a good analogy, a good thought here, okay? If we are doing what is right, if we are keeping those commandments and staying close to God, God can and will help us through our hard times. Okay, this isn't, this isn't Daniel doing deathbed repentance. This isn't Daniel going, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. Oh God, please forgive me of everything. Oh my gosh, you know, I hope my friends delete my Facebook history. Oh man, I'm going to be, oh, I'm going to come clean right now. It's my moment to meet God. I've got to come clean on everything and clear this out and hope for the best. No, 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 no. Daniel's not doing that at all. Daniel went in there going, I am right with my God. If I live, I live. If I die, I die. I'm okay with this outcome because I am right with God before I get into the situation. That is a better way for us to live, basically. That is the thing that's important for us to look at. That is how we get God's blessing to help us, is we have to do our part first, not right before the moment of destruction. We can't, we can't live our life one way and go, okay, God, I'm about to die. I will make you a deal. If you get me out of this, I will change myself. No, 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 no. You need to change before. You need to go into that problem having 
made everything right. That's the more important thing. And if you do, there are miracles that can be performed to bless you and help you. And that's the message of this story, basically, that I think we should get from the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Now verse 24. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces for every or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So all, so the king's pissed that they tried to basically, he realized they're just trying to oust Daniel. And so he takes all the people that, that tattled on him and said, nope, you guys are gone. And, and sends them all to the same fate they were going to send Daniel to, basically. Uh, verse 25, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So he, Daniel actually had served five kings, Nebuchadnezzar, evil Merodach, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. And there's, there's a few more smaller ones in there too. Few courtiers have had so long a reign, served so many masters without flattering any, been more successful in their management of public affairs, been so useful to the states where they were in office, or have been more owned of God, or have left such an example of posterity. That's Clark in his Bible commentary. Quite the, quite the, uh, not a eulogy, but a good thing on Daniel basically there, that Daniel really prospered. Daniel lived a long time. He really lived a long time to go through that many kings and to see these kinds of experiences. If you notice, Daniel's not going to Jerusalem. He is involved in the governmental affairs and doing things here. Remember, Daniel is a good example of how to live the gospel among the enemy. We talked about that at the beginning of the book of Daniel. You can go back and watch that video to get more on there. So some really powerful lessons from the life of Daniel that we get. Now, that's the first half of the book of Daniel. Now the second half of the book of Daniel, starting in the next chapter, is going to be more of Daniel's dreams, Daniel's visions and prophecies and things as well. So we're going to get more on the prophetic side of Daniel here coming up. So stay tuned for those videos. We'll see you over there next.